Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Module 6, and uh, the title is Three Theological Trajectories, or as Gonzalez calls them, typologies. Typologies are helpful devices. They help to group kinds of ideas together. This constellation of ideas with an is diverse from a, this constellation of ideas, diverse from another set of ideas. And the diversity is, is, um, is important to recognize while at the same time that there is a strong common ground. And I think both things are operating here in Gonzalez's book, and at least there's something I would want to, to share about it, that what we find is, yes, some diversity, but we also find a commonality. And the commonality is the rule of faith. All three of these authors affirm the rule of faith. In fact, you read in Blower's last week the different versions of the rule of faith, which are essentially the same, though with some variation and nuancing. But ultimately, they affirm the same story, the substance of the same story. So while we have three trajectories... They are trajectories that arise out of a common base, out of a common faith. And what's important to, to think about here is, as human beings affirm this common faith in diverse circumstances with diverse origins in terms of their own personal lives and the lives of their community, and the different struggles that appear in those communities, yes, Faith is going to be nuanced in different ways, and it's going to be applied and practiced in different ways. But the faith still remains the same. So a common faith with three trajectories. As you <clears throat> noticed when reading, or will read, Gonzalez, the three people he focuses on are Tertullian, who was from North Africa, particularly Carthage. Uh, he was the son of some Roman official uh, who was converted as an adult. And he basically was converted by watching the faith of the martyrs. He watched them die and watched their, their virtue and saw their virtue. And he was impressed with that faith. In fact, Tertullian is the one who gave us that phrase, <clears throat> the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, which was the seed of his own faith, is watching the martyrs die in the arena in Carthage. He himself was probably a lawyer. We don't know uh, absolutely, but certainly had some legal training and some sort of occupation in the legal world. And we could call him pugnacious. He liked to fight. He was a defender of the faith. Uh, some even say he was the Puritan before the Puritans. Um, so he was interested in maintaining the purity of the faith and the purity of virtue, uh, a strong moralist. Origen of Alexandria in Egypt was uh, grew up a Christian. His father was a Christian. In fact, his father was martyred uh, when he was about... Uh, in his, he was a teenager when his father was martyred. Uh, in fact, he wanted to be martyred with his father, but his mother uh, hindered him. Yeah, by hiding his clothes, so the story goes. But he was ordained a priest, which was a controversial thing in itself, uh, because he was ordained out of jurisdiction, but we won't get into the details of that. He is primarily remembered as a theologian and an ecclesial consultant. He's a troubleshooter. He would travel to different places and adjudicate different theological discussions. Uh, so he was becomes this... Um, uh, prominent theological uh, problem solver, you might say, uh, as he would enter into church churches and church consulting on theological matters. Uh, also, he was a, you know, all of these are, are huge writers. Uh, Tertullian wrote uh, like, like 31 books and Origen wrote more. Origen wrote commentaries. Origen did textual criticism. Uh, Origen was a linguist. Uh, so there, there are all kinds of factors that are going into play here. But the third one is Irenaeus. 
And Irenaeus is, uh, grew up in Asia Minor under the feet of Polycarp, but ultimately was, ended up being the Bishop of Lyon in France, what we now call France, southern France, what would then be the territory of Gaul, the province of Gaul. Um, and he was a pastor more than anything else, a pastor theologian, for, to be sure, uh, and a defender of the faith against the Gnostics. And he was primarily concerned, and one of the reasons he wrote his book against the heresies, against heresies, is he was concerned that um, that his leaders be equipped with the way of talking about the story, equipped with a way of refuting the Gnostics, and able to help those who are not able to read the illiterate among their flock, particularly those who do not speak Latin even, but, but speak uh, Gaelic or whatever the, the, the language of the, of the of the region was or the dialect of the region might have been, that they would have a way of saying, this is the faith and this is what we believe. And of course, that's the function of the rule of faith. And if someone who could not read, how are they going to refute the Gnostics? How are they going to maintain the purity of the faith? How are they going to maintain the story that has been handed down? Well, it's handed down through the rule of faith. It's handed down orally. Not from necessarily from reading scripture, because most people couldn't read. It's handed down through the rule of faith. And Irenaeus gives us several versions of this, all, all of which are strong, have, you know, tremendous overlap and lots of things in common, but just nuancing of wording and differences, but not differences in terms of contradictions, but different, just different language, different emphasis. Um, and that's what we find because of the fluidity of the rule of faith. But his most famous one is probably this one from the demonstration of the apostolic preaching, which I suggested to you earlier. And I, I put it up here again just to remind us of what the rule of faith is and to give a full statement of it here uh, as it appears in Irenaeus, beginning with God who is the creator and now the second article of faith uh, in one Christ, Jesus, the word of God and the son of God by whom God created the world. Uh, this is the one whom God recapitulates the world, uh, becoming human in order to reconcile all things and to recapitulate everything, to bring everything under one headship of, of God in Jesus Christ, who truly suffered and rose again. So you see the substance of the story there. And then the fuller explanation of, uh, of uh, what it means to articulate, I believe, in the Holy Spirit. It's about communion. It's about righteousness. It's about human life. It's about eschatology. It's about what God will bring about in the end and how God exercises this grace of immortality through the resurrection. And what I'd suggest, and as you read all the diversity here of, of Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Origen, all of whom had some overlap. For example, in in two in uh, you know two twenty, they're all alive. You know, or two ten, they're all alive in different regions of the Mediterranean world. That despite their diversity, which you will read about in Gonzales, they all affirm this common faith, and this common faith gets expressed differently in different philosophical frameworks, in different geographical realities, in different pressing issues of the culture. For example, Tertullian has a pressing issue, should Christians attend the theater when the theater is filled with lewd and immoral activities? Should Christians attend that? Should Christians, uh, should Christian women wear the veil when it's a, a display of morality and propriety in the Roman context of Carthage? But these are not issues that Irenaeus or Origen address because 
particularly Irenaeus. He's more on this frontier struggling with heresy. Uh, and Origen and Tertullian did as well. But, but the focus of Irenaeus is pastor. Uh, he's a pastor to the flock. Whereas Tertullian is more the moralist to the flock, <laughs> right? Trying to keep them in line. And Origen is more trying to struggle with the intellectual problems of Christianity and struggling with the philosophy of the day and how, how can Christianity make sense to a Platonic world or Neoplatonic world um, in which Origen lives or Middle Platonic would be a little bit earlier and Neoplatonic is on the rise with the time of Origen. So while they have diverse struggles, they are, nevertheless, they share a common faith. But here is the diversity that um, Gonzalez recognizes. And I think it's a helpful typology to think in terms of um, how to distinguish the nuances of the common faith that appear in each of these uh, different authors and how these different authors become kind of a, a fount for future developments. For example, Tertullian is a Latin writer writing in Carthage, North Africa, and his language is very transactional, it's very legal, it's about uh, satisfaction and expiation. Uh, the New Testament or the hermeneutical framework for Tertullian is very a law code-ish, you might say. And the eschatology is very strong, heaven, hell, get burned up kind of thing. So in Tertullian, you have this strong sense of legal, uh, that soteriology is about forgiveness, and atonement's about satisfaction, and we got to follow the law here. And, the, and Tertullian is the first one to use the phrase new law, right? The New Testament is a new law, or the covenant with Christ is a new law. And that becomes very influential in the Western tradition, particularly in the Roman Catholic tradition. And so the Roman Catholic tradition has had a strong emphasis on penance, on forgiveness, on atonement, atonement in terms of satisfaction, in terms of following rules, right? Law code. Um, it's a generalization. You have to take it as a generalization. There are other things going on. There is, in fact, the common faith that is still present. It's just being nuanced in a different way. With origin, it's more of a philosophical context. How to make sense of Christianity in the light of the philosophical realities that are present in origin's context. And so origin thinks more in terms of the transcendent God, the metaphysical realities. Like he believes in um, uh, uh, pre-existent souls, that the soul exists before it comes to the body, which is a very platonic sort of thing. Uh, Origen still affirms the common faith, but he's trying to explain things in a platonic way uh, and is influenced by Platonism and influenced by philosophical uh, characterizations and philosophical frameworks. And so for him, the, the goal uh, is not, you know, redemption is not so much an expiation or forgiveness of sin, it's, it's a transformation. Ultimately, a transformation that returns to the soulishness of the pre-existent soul in a spiritual realm. And so he reads scripture a lot of times to, to discover the spiritual dimension of the world. Uh, which is the metaphysical reality. And he does that by using allegory. Allegory becomes a major method of interpretation for origin. Not necessarily a bad thing, but because allegory is used by, by all early Christian authors. But he uses it um, uh, to discern the spiritual realities and to uh, speculate about the spiritual realities. And he recognizes that when he when he talks about the rule of faith, he says, "Now, what I'm going to I'm going to live within the rule of faith, but I'm going to also use the resources of the culture and re resources of philosophy, in particular, to 
elaborate, explain, um, to, to make it palatable, you might say. I think that might be a little unfair. Um, but to make it more understandable to the culture in which we live. And so there's kind of a, uh, there's a strong affirmation of the faith, but there's a nuancing of the faith in a way that can speak to the culture in which he lives. And that gives origin a kind of a philosophical flavor, uh, which has a strong influence in the Eastern Church. And the Eastern Church has a very strong sense of the transformation and the metaphysic and the transcendent. They don't buy everything. You know, the Orthodox Church doesn't buy everything and the origin goes with here. But there is a strong flavor to the Eastern Church um, that is deeply, that resonates with, that is a part of um, the milieu of origin's own theology. But it's not identical. So don't don't think Eastern Church and origin are kind of, oh, they're the same. No, they're... There, there's differences, uh, some very significant differences between the two. The third category is is Irenaeus. And Irenaeus, some say he's kind of the first biblical theologian. That is, he's the first narrative kind of theologian. He, he, when he addresses the heresies and he wants to say, look, they have one narrative, we have a different narrative. They have this story, we have a different story. And so his attention is focused on explaining the story of God. And so he does this overarching biblical narrative sort of thing, much, much like what I did with the theodrama. And Irenaeus is kind of wanting to do the same thing. And he does walk through the same thing, although he doesn't give much attention to Israel, uh, except for prophecies. Uh, but he does give attention to creation and Christ and church and new creation. And he lays that out in a very strong way for the sake of the church. And so um, he emphasizes incarnation as the act of God that liberates the world. Uh, he focuses on, on what, how God is managing the world, that is the economic. Economic doesn't refer to money here. It refers to how the world is managed and how God works in it, and how God redeems it within history. And so he's very focused not on the metaphysic, that is the transcendent outside of the creation or outside of history. He is focused on what God did in history. That's the economic. And so it becomes a strong narrative hermeneutic that is about liberation, redemption, recapitulation, to re to add up the world again under the headship of God toward a renewed earth. That creation is to be redeemed, not annihilated. Creation is going to be redeemed. And so that's a different sort of nuancing. Certainly different from Tertullian and Origen. And what we find in Irenaeus is, I think, a lot of the Eastern Church. You know, I, I, When I think about the Eastern Orthodox Church, I think Origen and Irenaeus kind of overlapping with a strong maybe even most the most uh, the most emphasis is on the Irenaean picture here uh, although the metaphysic comes very strongly into play for the Greek Orthodox Church so Roman Catholic Church you found mainly Tertullian the trajectory of Tertullian in the Greek Orthodox Church in Orthodoxy you find mainly Irenaeus, but a heavy dose of origin. And what Gonzalez wants us to hear, I think, is, uh, and we can be too, ah, we can do this in, in, you know, in unthinking ways and just throw people into categories. And No, it's, it's just not that neat and nice. I mean, it's helpful to think in terms of trajectories, but we have to remember these are generalizations. And they don't necessarily apply to everybody. And that one, you can't force people into a category, right? So keep that in mind. But I do think it is helpful to say in the second and third centuries of the church, 
we're already seeing some trajectories. We're always seeing some emphases. And Gonzalez tends to think that Irenaeus's trajectory ultimately leads us to liberation theology, and particularly its narrative of liberation. And there might be some truth to that, but I think there's also some truth that, um, that Irenaeus pops up in every tradition, in every trajectory in some form or fashion, because the common faith the common faith yields a lot of Irenaean generalizations. So let's be careful that we don't just pop people into categories, but let's learn from the tradition that, yeah, people in different situations, in different contexts, in different geography, different languages do nuance the common faith in different ways. And this is the impact of culture. And if culture impacted them, well, I imagine it impacts us as well, don't you think? And that's a lesson to learn. May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.